Hey everybody, it's Frank Spear back with you for another episode of Watch This. There are some who hold to the belief that in AD 70, when the kingdom arrived, that those who were believers were gathered in from Israel, and those who were unbelievers were not allowed in, and that the door to the kingdom was shut, and that no one ever after AD 70 was allowed in ever again, because the door was shut, closed at that time, and so there has ever since been no availability of relationship with God since that time. I've had people comment on my uh, YouTube video saying, hey Frank, you're dreaming man, thinking that there's any kingdom available for today. Read Matthew 25, brother, the door was shut, closed in AD 70. You can't get in, nobody could get in after that time. Well, what I wanna do today, and by the way, let me just say this. I've disabled comments on my YouTube videos, not because I can't answer the questions or I can't defend my positions, but because some people are just downright nasty. They come on there just to fight, just to argue. Their, their purpose is not to learn or to have dialogue, but to dismantle my position. And they do it with, un they do it with unkind words they do it with uh, harsh judgments, and they do it constantly. They're constantly putting stuff up. So then I answer the questions the best I can, and then I ask them some questions, and they don't deal with that, but then they move on to more questions. And then when I answer those questions, they move on to another question, rather than saying, hey, good point, Frank, geez, I never thought of that, or, well, that doesn't work because, no, they just move on to something else. And then... Um, you know, and then I find myself looking all the time, getting alerted on my phone that there's a new comment, a new comment, a new comment, and it's just taking up too much of my time. You know, I was out with my wife the other day, and she said, are you going to look at your phone all day and keep answering these people? And I said, you know what? That's it. I'll put up my stuff. People can listen. Uh, if they like it, they like it. If they hate it, they hate it. That's fine. <laughs> you know, if you have a question for me, then send me an email, lightshine seventy at gmail.com. Now I'll get bombarded by these people in my emails. Um, but anyway, I'll just delete them if they're nasty, so it'll be the same thing. Anyway, uh, what I want to show today is the door being shut is only speaking of the separation between the believer and the unbeliever, and that you could still get in after AD 70. Jesus' parables, a lot of these, the parable of the fig tree, the parable of the thief, the parable of the ten virgins, the parable of the talents, the, the parable of the sheep and the goats, right? These are all the same thing. They're saying the same thing, in essence, at, at bottom, at the core. It's, they're all saying, there's, at the end, at the time of the judgment, there's going to be a separation from those who followed Messiah and, and those who rejected Messiah the sheep and the goats. And I want to quickly go through these parables and then highlight some things for you today, okay? So let's start in Matthew chapter 24. Remember the context here? They ask, they're coming out of the temple. Jesus says, not one stone will be left upon another in this most sacred of places where the presence of God was for national Israel. Jesus says, this place is going to be destroyed. And they say, when will that end come? When will that ending, the end of the temple in this system, be? That's the end that was coming. That's the end they were anticipating. And at the end of that would be the beginning of something new, the kingdom that Jesus said was at hand and near. At the time that that comes, that kingdom, which is also called in the scripture the resurrection, the catching up, the, um, the wedding feast, the new Jerusalem, the adoption as sons, the inheritance. There's lots of um, ways, metaphors, in which that new kingdom is described. The new child in Israel was laboring, right? In birth pains, Revelation chapter 12. Paul talks about this. The whole creation groans as if in the pains of childbirth, waiting for something to be born. The new, the new man, or the new kingdom, if you will, right? So, let's start here in Matthew uh, 24, 32, 
and I'm going to blaze through this, right? Uh, so let's start in verse 32. He, this is the parable of the fig tree. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. Now, very often in scripture, Israel is signified, symbolized by the fig tree, figuratively, right? Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So too, when you see all these things that I just spoke about happening, when, they're, when they start taking place, recognize that he is, right, is near, right at the door. Speaking of himself and his coming, realize that your Messiah, your Savior, is right at the door. When you see these things, truly I say to you, this generation, this generation that I'm talking about, that I'm talking to, that I'm speaking to right now, this generation of Israel, a generation for Israel was 40 years. This generation would not pass away until all these things come to pass. Everything I just talked about, all of that. Okay, so this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And it's not coincidental that Jesus went away for 40 years. That's a generation. Then the end came. And the kingdom was taken away from them, Israel, and given to another that would produce fruit of it. So something ended, something began. He says, verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away. Heaven and earth is old covenant Israel. It's the temple and that system, right? God's presence, heaven was inside the holy of holies. The tabernacle was seen, the temple was seen as heaven for Israel, for the Jews. It was seen as heaven, the Shekinah glory, the cloud of God, right? The cloud comes down figuratively and dwells in the holy place, signifying heaven come down to earth. We see that again in Revelation 21, the tabernacle of God where the Shekinah cloud was now comes down out of heaven, right? In the New Jerusalem and God tabernacles where the Shekinah glory was among men. So he was tabernacling among men in this temple in Jerusalem that was about to be destroyed. But then that would be taken away from them and there would be a new Jerusalem, right? An invisible one. And the new Shekinah glory, the new cloud, would be there. Right? That's why Jesus was coming with the cloud, in the cloud. Right? He's coming in the new presence of God, in the new Jerusalem, where God tabernacled among men, and now in a new way. But there are a lot of folks who want to say, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, you're misunderstanding all that. In AD 70, they were all taken up into heaven, in, in, in the invisible realm up there. Those are the clouds. That's the air. That's the heavenly places. Well, not all throughout the New Testament. That's not, the heavenly places aren't literally in a celestial realm. They were seated with heavenly places in Christ while they were walking around on planet Earth 2,000 years ago. So do you think when they were caught up to the, to the new heavens that they were literally whisked away into the sky in a Superman rapture, invisible or visible? Either way doesn't matter. No, they were taken up into the new Shekinah cloud which dwelled on earth in the new Jerusalem, the new kingdom community that came. All right. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Well, the old heaven and earth was built on the old word. When Moses gave the people of Israelites the commandments, the literal Hebrew word is there, the words. He gave them the words of God. That was the old covenant law, the old covenant system. That would pass away. Jesus said, but my word, my commandments... My kingdom that I'm bringing in, that I'm ushering in, will never pass away. This is the Beatitudes, right? Jesus says, you have heard it said. Then he quotes from the law of Moses. Then he says, but I say, right? In this new kingdom, here's what I say about it. Here's what life is going to be like in the eternal life of the new kingdom. See, because the old kingdom was not eternal. The life of the old kingdom was not eternal. Even when old Israel, covenant Israelites died, they waited somewhere to be taken into the new eternal life kingdom. So the old kingdom can be viewed as eternal, uh, as a temporary life, right? It was a temporary way to live under the old covenant system. The new covenant system, the new kingdom, never passes away. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, the old covenant system, but my words, my heaven and earth, 
will never pass away. That's why in Revelation chapter 20, we see, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth because the first heavens and the first earth passed away. Jesus said it would happen. In Revelation 20, we see it happening. And in Revelation 21 and 22, we see a description of that new heavens and earth. John chapter 1, the Gospel of John, begins very much like Genesis begins. That's the beginning of the Old Covenant system. Genesis, uh, John chapter 1 starts in the beginning, right? Was the Word, there's Word again. In the beginning was the new, was Jesus come in flesh, giving the new commands of God that are coming in the new kingdom that was at hand at the time, near, soon to come, which hadn't come yet until that generation passed away 40 years later. Something new arrived. Now, our I.O. friends and others will say, well, at that time the door was shut, nobody was allowed in. Those people were whisked away into an invisible realm. Nobody was allowed in after that. Well, let's see if that bears out. But my words will never pass away. But on that day, uh, but of the day and the hour, no one knows when this is all going to go down. No one knows the exact time. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone knows. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. Just like. Well, what happened in the days of Noah? Was anybody taken away literally into an invisible realm in the days of Noah? No. They were put in the ark, a type of Christ, and they were taken up and to the mountain of Ararat. And that's where their protection was from the destruction of the flood. There's always these mountains popping up, right? Mount Ararat, Mount Sinai. Uh, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, right? When they were caught up in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, they're being caught up to the new mountain of the Lord. Isaiah, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. And the word of the Lord, the word that will never pass away, the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem, from the new Jerusalem. They, they didn't understand that it would be an invisible kingdom. And the, and, and the writers of the New Testament tell us that the Old Testament prophets didn't understand the things they wrote about. When they wrote about this coming kingdom in the first century, they didn't understand what was coming. It says they longed to look into these things, but they didn't know. They didn't get it. Even the New Testament disciples we see don't get it. They still think that at the return of Messiah, at his coming, at his parousia, that he's going to literally defeat the Roman Empire and set up a throne like David in Israel, and they're going to rule literally from planet Earth. The Messiah would rule sitting on a physical throne in the Middle East, in the Promised Land. And they ask Jesus about that in Acts chapter 1, and he doesn't answer. He says, look, we're not going to go into that now. Go to Jerusalem, wait for the Holy Spirit. He'll reveal this stuff to you. And gradually they came to an understanding. Oh. And Paul really saw it. He had these revelations from God. And he's the one that basically unfolds these mysteries. And even Peter says, boy, Paul's letters, his writings are hard to understand. They were learning from Paul's writings. That revelatory information that God was giving to him that it was not a literal return to planet earth and a not a literal setting up of a literal kingdom but this would be a kingdom not made with hands that was coming and Jesus himself said it a few times I mean he gave them a clue right he said you won't say when the kingdom comes here it is or there it is look there's Jesus on his throne in Jerusalem let's go we're going to take over that we're going to defeat the Roman Empire we're going to war with Messiah a miraculous war will he'll defeat them Right? No. They didn't understand. Lost my train of thought there. I was headed somewhere with that. <laughs> right? But they didn't understand that it was, it was going to be a kingdom not made with hands. Jesus said, look, you're not going to say, look, there it is, or here it is, there's Messiah. No, he says, but the, <clears throat> but the kingdom will be within you when it comes. It's inside. It's a spiritual, internal thing. Okay. For, like, verse 38. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand, there it is again, they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. To heaven? 
This is rapture language, right? In a sense, right? This is the taken. They were taken away. And they did not understand until the flood came, watch this, and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now you can look at this two ways. This could be talking about Noah and those in the ark, and they were taken away up to Mount Ararat. Safety, salvation, and spared the flood that came, the destruction. And so in AD 70, right, they were caught up to the new mountain of the Lord, taken away, raptured, harpazo, to the new Jerusalem, to meet the Lord in the air, in the heavens, the new place of his heavenly presence, Shekinah glory. Now, some people interpret this to say, well, this was the taken away in the destruction, the ones who died in the flood. Okay, either way it works. I see it the first way. Now watch this. He says, so will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. It's going to be just like the days of Noah. Nobody went away into heaven in the days of Noah. They went into the ark and they went up to Mount Ararat. Now you could say, well, that's a symbol of them going to heaven. Okay, that's the way you want to take it. But there are thousand other scriptures that show otherwise. Because the church continued. Not to mention all the scriptures, but the church actually did continue and been continuing for 2,000 years despite its being warped and corrupted doctrinally and all of that. Watch this. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Watch. Then, at that time, at the coming, just like in the days of Noah, there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women grinding at the mill stone, right? One will be taking, taken and another left. This is a separation. We're going to see that in every parable that we're going to look at today. This is all throughout Jesus' parables. The word taken here is not harbazo. It's another Greek word, but it literally means the same thing. They're going to be received. One will be in the field working. Two will be in the field working, I'm sorry. One will be received into the new kingdom, into the ark, the place of safety, the wedding feast, the new Jerusalem, one will be received in. It literally means admitted into. You got a ticket to the movies that says admit one, right? That's what this word means. Two, he says there'll be a separation, the, the sheep and the goats. It's the same in every parable, right? So follow me here. At the time of the coming of the Son of Man, it will be just like the time of Noah when the floods came. And they got into the ark of safety. Right? Some got into the ark. Some did not get into the ark. Some get into the wedding feast. Some did not get into the wedding feast. Some come into the New Jerusalem. Some do not come into the New Jerusalem. It's all the same thing. There'll be two men in the field. One will be admitted. One of these Israelites, one of these Jews will be admitted into the kingdom at the coming. And one will not be. One will be a sheep. One will be a goat. One will have a ticket to the wedding feast. One will not. Well, okay, so therefore, be on the alert, for you do not know the day or the hour. But be sure of this. If the head of the house had known what time at night, uh, night the thief was coming, he would be on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will come. So Jesus now compares himself to a thief coming in the night where people are going to be unprepared, just like at the time of Noah. And why is he why is he call himself a thief here? Because he's coming to plunder the old house. He's coming to steal from the old covenant, right? This kingdom will be taken away from you and given to another. He says, I'm coming in AD 70 at the Parousia, at my return, to steal. Your, that's from that old house and give the presence of God. I'm stealing the Shekinah glory from the old house, the destruction of the temple system, and I'm giving it the Shekinah glory. I'm giving the new temple to another group of people, to another community. Verse 45, who then is faithful and sensible? Who's the faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that slave who the master finds doing what he's supposed to do when he comes. 
truly I say to you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master's not coming for a long time, 2 Peter chapter 3, some were saying that, he's not coming. <clears throat> right? If that evil slave, the goats, and he begins to beat his fellow slaves, the, the Jews that persecuted the Christians. He begins to beat his fellow slaves. He's not coming. Your whole gospel thing is a bunch of nonsense. Let's, let's persecute these Christians. Let's kill them. Let's imprison them. Let's torture them. He says, if I find that happening, watch this, and he begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect and in the hour which he does not know, watch this, and cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, let's unpack that verse. Cut him in pieces. If you look at the Greek word there, it's literally talking about a lashing, a scourging. That's what they called cutting them in pieces. They were be He says, I will whip that wicked servant or slave. Right? Did Jesus literally at the coming take out a cat of nine tails and whip every unbeliever? No, this is figurative for their rejection by Messiah. They would be rejected. This is their AD 70. This, this verse 51 is a summary of AD 70 and the judgment that took place, just like the sheep and the goats we're going to look at. Okay? He will cut him in pieces and assign him in a place. With the hypocrites. Who were the hypocrites? Matthew 23. Jesus talks to the Pharisees. You hypocrites this. You hypocrites that. These were the apostate Jews. The apostate Israelites. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Outside the new Jerusalem. They would not be allowed in. And out there there would be regret. Now it doesn't mean they would be repent. Because they didn't. Most of them died. In the fire, signified here by the whipping. Some did repent afterwards, I'm sure, and come in. Even we see in the scripture, it says many Pharisees were being saved, were believing. <clears throat> then some fell away, but some remained faithful. Do we think for a moment that after AD 70, some of the survivors didn't say, oh my gosh, these uh, preachers of Christ were right and entered into the New Jerusalem? Of course they did. But many refused and did not see this as a judgment of God. 80, 70. But most of them died. They perished. Outside the kingdom. We see this again in Revelation 21 and 22. Okay? Verse 20. Now let's jump into chapter 25. Parable of the ten virgins. Same story. Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared, right? The kingdom of heaven will be comparable. Hadn't come yet. When it comes, it will be comparable to this parable I'm about to tell you. Will be compared to ten virgins, bridesmaids, if you will, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. So the groom is coming. This is what's taking place at the coming. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. Sheep and the goats. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, another will be left. Same, same thing, just another way to tell it. Five were foolish, five were wise. Some were sheep, some were goats. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Uh, I guess that could be symbolic of the Holy Spirit or the faith in, faith in Messiah, whatever, their belief. Either way, they fall away, which Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, verse 10, at that time, right, They'll be delivering you to tribulation and they'll kill you and so forth. The persecution would come just like we just read in the last parable. And at that time, many will fall away from the faith and betray one another and hate one another and mislead many. So here we go. Same thing here. But the prudent took oil in their flasks along with their lamps. They were prepared. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. So they're going out to meet the bridegroom. This is the axe period. They're waiting for him to come, right? And while they're going out, they've got oil in their lamps and they've got extra oil, right? They're staying faithful, but the others are not. They're falling away. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight, there was a shout. Here it comes. <clears throat> Behold, the bridegroom is here. Come on out to meet him. 
1 Thessalonians 4.17. They'll meet the Lord in the air, in the heavens, in the new place of his presence, which, was, which will be in the new Jerusalem, in the new tabernacle of God, among men that came down from heaven, out from God, to men, the text says. There's no way to make the down up. There's no way to make the out from God mean up to God. There's no way to make the tabernacle among men mean the tabernacle among God in heaven and men went there in a literal heaven. <clears throat> now, while, And I've asked that of our IO friends over and over again. I put out a, valid, uh, a video, um, a polite challenge to IO, to Israel only. Who, and, and, and many of them believe that at the end, somehow they all went up. And the presence of God is up in a, in a visible realm. And I've asked them to show from Revelation 21, those first three verses, that the down means up. How? And the out from means up to. And the presence of God among men literally doesn't mean that at all, but it means the presence of men among God. They've yet to reply. I've asked it in my YouTube comments... I've asked them repeatedly to explain it, and they don't. What do they do? They just ask me another question. They poo-poo what I say. They say it's ridiculous. Then they say, well, then what are you going to do with this verse? Or what are you going to do with that verse? Then I say, okay, we'll get to that later. Could you just answer my first question? Nope. They never do. And yet, they mock me as an idiot. Okay, that's cool. If that's your thing and you get off on that, all right. So watch this now. Uh, okay, I won't say any more about that. <laughs> but at midnight, watch this, there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, shout, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Right? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And it says, Come out and meet him. Watch this. Then all the virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. They were ready. But the foolish said to the prudent, Hey, we're not ready. Give us some of the oil so we can light our lamps. But the prudent answered, There's not enough for us and you. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And when they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast. And here's their big thing. And the door was shut. There it is, according to Israel only. The door was shut. That's it over can't get in anybody ever again well that contradicts so many other passages of scripture that say that the kings of the earth will bring their glory the glory of god into this thing the gates are wide open forever and people are still coming in well if it's in heaven and the gates are open if it's in literal heaven and the gates remain open up there in the invisible realm somewhere who's who keeps coming in what kings of the earth keep bringing their glory in? And why are the gates open? What are they open for in heaven? They should be shut. You say the door's shut here. This proves it. So why are the gates in the new Jerusalem open 24-7, 365? Revelation 21 says that. Why? It doesn't make any sense. It's completely unreasonable for the gates in heaven to be open if they were shut here. So if the gates of Revelation 21 in the New Jerusalem, if the gates are open all the time forever, then, then this shutting here of this door cannot mean that it's shut forever. Because this door to the wedding feast is the same as the gates. It's entrance into the new kingdom. And I ask them that and they don't answer that either. They move on to some asking me more questions. But I'm dishonest, they say. I'm being dishonest. How? All right, let's go on here. Watch this. The door was shut. It was shut to them. It was shut to them. One was taken, one was left. The, the ones who were left and not caught up in the new kingdom, it's the same as the door was shut on them. It's open for believers, but it's shut to non-believers. It was shut to the wicked slaves. It was shut to the goats. Watch this now. Verse 11. 
Later, the other virgins, those wicked people, right, also came saying, Lord, they knocked, let us in, let us in. See, they supposed they could still get in. Watch this. Why can't they get in? Because it's shut and nobody can ever come into the... No, watch. But he answered, truly I say to you, I don't know you. That's why you can't come in. Do you suppose if they said, we repent, we repent. We're believers now that he would have opened the door? Of course. But he answered, truly I say to you, I don't know you. So you can't come in. That the shutting of the door isn't the shutting of the door on everyone eternally. The gates are wide open forever into the wedding feast. This wedding celebration goes on eternally. When you come into this kingdom, you've entered the eternal life of that kingdom. The old kingdom was not a kingdom of eternal life. It was life in God, but it was in Adam, and it was in Moses, and that died. It was not an eternal kingdom. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word, the new heaven and earth, will never pass away. That's what the Bible means by eternal life. The eternal life of that kingdom. Then he says to them, be on the alert, for you do not know the day or the hour. The rejectors of Messiah were not allowed in. Those were the ones to whom the door was shut. If he did know them, the door would have opened to them. One will be taken, one will be left. Some are sheep, some are goats. The door is open to some, the door is closed to some. But they want to say, that's the end of relationship with the God of the Bible. Right there, the door shut. So Jesus went, Jesus went away. The kingdom was coming. 40 years they waited for it. It came and then the door shut on it. That's the end. Again, I'll go back and make the point again because I think it's a good one. If this kingdom is in the invisible realm in heaven and no one else could ever enter after AD 70, why are the gates wide open 24-7, 365 in the new kingdom? Someone needs to answer that from the Israel-only movement. Those gates should be shut, barring anyone from entrance ever again. Got the rain now. I don't think it affects my voice, but I'll move a little closer just in case. Let's move on to another parable. Same story. Matthew 25, verse 14. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents. You know the story, so I won't belabor it. Let's shoot down to the end. Now the master returns to those same slaves, by the way, for our futurist friends who believe that Jesus is still yet to come in the future, that his return has not happened, but it will happen in the future. Realize here in this parable, he leaves his possessions with certain people, and he returns back to those same people to give an account for what they did with what he entrusted to them. He comes back to the same people, the same slaves, the same servants. There's no way around that, my futurist friend. I love you. I was a futurist for a long time, believing in the future return of Messiah, waiting for him to crack the sky and come down and get me. But that's just not what the Bible teaches. It took me a long time to see it. I hope you see it. He returned to the same people he entrusted the gifts to. The same workers. That's what he said he would do. This generation will not pass away until I come back. It all works. After a long... Okay, so where are we? Okay, so watch this. So, let's get that back. He gives the talents. He gives some more than others. He comes back now to judge people. And we'll shoot down to... Let's see, verse 26. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put the money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have... Uh, received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who had ten talents. This kingdom will be taken away from you and given to another who will produce the fruit of it. That parable is just, This parable is just elaborating that saying by Jesus. That's all. The wicked servant who did not do the will of God 
while Messiah was away, had everything taken away from him at the return of Messiah. It's all the same, folks. Watch this. Now throw out the worthless slave into outer darkness, outside the New Jerusalem. You're not you're outside the wedding. The door is shut to you. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Same thing. Now many of them actually died during the war of 66 to 70. The Roman Jewish war. So they were cast outside the kingdom. They were being cast out of it that whole time. And at the very end they were dead, gone, perished. And then those who were alive had no kingdom left. That kingdom was destroyed. And there was a brand new kingdom. And they were not allowed in. They were not a part of it. Now you want to, Here's another parable. Same thing. Matthew 25, 31. The sheep and the goats. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate them one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats believers from unbelievers goats throughout the old testament hairy goat the original hebrew word uh, was a symbol of um, pagan idolatry heathen idol worship so these who were who were the goats who did not get into the new kingdom were the ones who took the mark of the beast who were associated with rome and god considered that pagan idolatry the worship of Caesar God. We have no king but Caesar, they said. Who said that? The hypocrites. The same people, wicked servants Jesus is talking to here. Watch this. All the, all the uh, nations will be gathered before him and he will separate, I mean, all the peoples, the ethnos will be gathered before him and he will set, that's Israel there. And any foreigners that join themselves to Israel were considered Israel. So he'll call them before him, all the peoples of Israel at the end. Not literally. Jesus didn't at his coming literally sit on a throne, a literal throne, and call them all before him and open a literal book and say, okay, uh, you like Santa's naughty or, night lit, uh, naughty or nice list, and say, you, check, okay, you stand over here. All those who are entering the kingdom, uh, please file over to my right. And all of those who are the goats, uh, you file over to my left because you didn't make it. No, this is symbolism. This is all symbolism. Did Jesus really give anybody talents? Right? Did he give anybody talents? Was there any literal lamps and oil? This is all symbolism. For either in AD 70, at the end of the old, and the initiation of the new, you were either in the new or you weren't. That's it. All of this is just symbolizing that. So at the time of the judgment in AD 70, when the old was destroyed forever, eternally annihilated, that old covenant system, that's the time, that's the judgment here of the sheep of the goats. That's the time the book was open. That's the time Jesus sat on his throne and put all his enemies under his feet. That's the time that he separated the sheep from the goats. No literal sucking away into an invisible realm and that actually happening in a giant room somewhere. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left and the king will come and say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What foundation of the world? John 1.1, 1, 1, the new creation, the new world that, was, that started with Messiah. That was... John 1.1 1, 1 is describing the foundation of the new covenant world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. He goes on, here's why you sheep are allowed in and here's why you goats are not allowed in. Same thing. Some had oil, some didn't have oil. Some did well with the talents, some didn't do well with the talents. It's all the same. So what, what happens at the end of this parable? Well, let's look at it again. Then he will say to those on his left, the goats depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been, pre been prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, the devil and his angels, the high priest and the apostate Jews. The devils and his angels. Not some invisible uh, beast or fallen angel from heaven, literal angel with wings, some creature 
who rebelled against God in heaven long ago and fell to the netherworld, and then all the angels who rebelled with him were cast out of heaven to the netherworld? No. This is talking about, like every other parable, where does it mention... Where does, it, where does it mention the literal devil and literal angels as we know them with the pitchforks and stuff? Where, where is that in any of the other parables? He's talking about people in the other parables. He's just using figurative language, language here to talk about those same people. The goats are Satan and his angels, right? The one taken, uh, the one taken are the sheep. The one left are the goats or the devil or Satan or the serpents and the, his angels. It's the apostate Jewish rulers and their followers. It's the old heavens and earth. You see? Then he said to those, Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Here, earlier he says, watch this, verse 34 of Matthew 25. Uh, 25. He says, Then the king will say to those on his right, The sheep come you who are blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of this new world. But these people, the goats, he says, now you're going to a place of destruction that was prepared for you because you rejected Messiah. Depart from me. The door is closed to you. Depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire. That's AD 70. That's the lake of fire. I did a whole video on the lake of fire. If you want to see that, you, I go into detail. Watch the video. I keep pointing as if the video is down there somewhere. Check out my other. Check out my video on the lake of fire for what that means. I go into detail. Revelation 14, Revelation 20. What was the lake of fire? It was the destruction of Jerusalem and that whole temple system in AD 70. Not some hell underneath the earth somewhere where people who are wicked die and go and are burned forever. No. I could see the language sounds like that, but once you understand the Old Testament and you know it well, you would, you would plainly understand that these people to whom Jesus said these things totally understood what he was talking about based on their Bibles, which was the Old Testament scripture. I was talking about a destruction of a city. The destruction of a city, Jerusalem, which was burned with fire, literally, by the Romans. Then he tells them why they wouldn't make it in. Okay? So folks, that's it for today. I'll just close by saying one of the people who came on my YouTube videos when I was talking about Matthew 22, they watched my video on Matthew 22 showing that a wedding invitation went out. Those who were initially invited rejected the wedding invitation. The city was burned, AD 70. Those people were destroyed who rejected the, first, the invitation when it was first given. Then afterward, the invitation went out again. And they went out into the highways this time, out into the entire world and invited people to come in. So they watched that video and they said, well, why don't you read the parallel uh, passages in the other Gospels, which I just did, there's one in Luke, but no need to go. It's the same thing. Check it out for yourselves. Check out the parallel passages of these parables in Luke. <laughs> Excuse me. Once you understand it this way, you'll see that it makes sense everywhere. The gates are open. So they watched my video on Matthew 22 and said, Hey, you should read the parallel passages before you do a video. You'll see that the door was shut and nobody ever was allowed in again. Now, if you're watching this, you must, the onus is on you, you must answer the question of the open gates in the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21. All right, guys, thanks for your time. I really do appreciate you watching. If you like it, thumbs up. If you hate it, thought it sucked, thumbs down. And I'll see you guys in the next one. I'll put a link to my book on demons below because for many of you, the demons turn out to be, in my estimation, uh, something completely other than what what you may have thought they were. Certainly something other than what I thought they were. But months and months ago, I was reading the scriptures and a light came on. And so I began to do the work and I thought, oh man, I see it clearly now. So I wrote this book called Cast Them Out. Who were the biblical demons? Uh, there'll be a link below to the Amazon site where you can buy that. Thank you guys. I'll see you next time.